Accutron Watches present. From New York City, this is the Accutron Show, a time travel through American culture with your hosts, Bill McCuddy, Scott Alexander, and David Graver. Visit AccutronWatch.com and discover the brand that has made American history with an all-new proprietary next-generation electrostatic energy movement. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. I do. I remember going to the studio and basically saying, you know, this is the mandate from the governor. Broadway is shutting down for what we knew then a month, but we will do everything in our power to continue to tell the stories of the community. The person you heard at the top of the show is our guest today. He's Frank DeLella. He's the host of Spectrum News' New York One On Stage program. He's also an Emmy Award winner. But first, a guy who's never won an Emmy. That's me, Bill McCuddy. Next to these two guys, this is Scott Alexander and David Graver. Five Emmys apiece. <laughs> no one likes a bragger. Uh, we're going to talk today about the return of Broadway. Can it happen? We've got a barn. Let's put on a show. It's going to happen. <laughs> Let's put on a show here, too, when we return. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our iconic Space View 2020 collection, recreating the stunning visual impact of the original open dial design combined with an all new electrostatic energy movement. Time just changed again. The Accutron Space View 2020. Well, Broadway's coming back, and we're back in a way. And for the first time, we're on camera. So if you're listening to this podcast, you can go to YouTube now and see the Accutron show. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. Uh, Time will from, tell. Did you bag. know we were going to be on TV when you put that shirt on today? I said to myself, you know what? <laughs> Let's go for it. Yeah. Um, listen, uh, New York, uh, as has the rest of the world, gone through an unbelievable time period and we want to be entertained again and so broadway as we are recording this and airing it in july uh has said that it's coming back well we've been entertained throughout this pandemic in some ways we've been like saturated with entertainment we learned all the different ways we can feed information to our brains just over and over and over uh but what we haven't done Who is tweeted go- out that they finished netflix the other night <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah but what we haven't done is go out and enjoy it with other people Yeah. And one of the things I'm concerned about, David, is that we learned during the pandemic that we can just watch everything on television. And I think major movie chains are scared now that people are never going to go back to movie theaters except for something like James Bond or Fast and Furious. So it's a totally different proposition for New York and for Broadway. People have got to show up. People will show up. I think it will begin with New Yorkers, and I think New Yorkers will sort of pave the way for the rest of the world. There is nothing like Broadway. Broadway is an internationally recognizable brand, and it's a name. And as someone who actually studied playwriting as part of his college education, there is nothing like the interaction between person and audience. And that doesn't happen in other places. Getting a lot of mileage out of that playwriting uh, <laughs> class you took. <laughs> it's parents are proud. Well, film, but film does this too. There's something different. When you see a film in a theater with an audience, you can see a film in a theater and yeah, it's a nice big screen. But I, I went to a screening. I had seen The Shining probably 10 times before I first saw it in a movie theater with a full house. Oh, so the first time you saw The Shining was on television or was, was on, on a VHS. little screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah. VHS. It was. Google it, kids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I went to college a minute ago, uh, but but not so long ago that I could have seen it in the theater, right? So I didn't see it uh, probably five years ago. I saw it um, on the big screen, and all of a sudden, I realized The Shining is half a comedy. <laughs> Seriously, people laugh. You're in there, and these these things, and because every, everyone has seen the movie, and there's all this stuff. Right. People go, oh, like it, it works. I would say that's an evolution. It works though. on other. No, right. but the film is made to work on multiple levels. Some of which are really only apparent when there's an audience there, and so that's what I love the experience of being there around other people enjoying something. But our guest today has spent so much time in the theater and knows so much about whether it can fail or be success that I'll be really interested to hear a couple of things. What's he looking forward to? Uh, I know what I want to see again. Uh, and where where is some of the new talent coming from? I mean, it's not going to be just revivals. Is it everything we've seen before just retread well, there's again? There's always for revivals. The, well, a lot of revivals. And, and But revivals, the only reason something gets revived is because it's great. 
Um, Nothing bad gets revived. They also serve a purpose. They are a reintroduction to a new generation or a new group of people. And you need familiarity. There's a whole uh, set of the public that goes to see these things that are not experts in Broadway. Humming the, the tunes inside out of town. as they hum them coming out. They want to see Annie, right? <laughs> There's nothing no wrong one, with Annie. No Annie's one, wants one of the first see musicals. Annie. Love Annie's Annie. amazing. <laughs> Bill. I have Bill. a question then, Bill. Shame. Right. What are you looking forward to? I have a, uh, I'm looking forward to Moulin Rouge. I didn't have the opportunity to see it before everything closed. And I just want the power, the energy, the, the speed of it all, the bright colors and the flashing lights that to me are very Broadway. I would say of the three of us, you are the most, you're the Tony Randall. You're the most New Yorker to the core, to the to the extent that you say, we've got to go. We've, we've got to go. grab everybody on our floor or on our block. <laughs> We're going to go see, uh, in your case, Moulin Rouge. Love the movie, haven't seen the play, so I want to see the play very much. What are you looking forward to? My favorite thing about Broadway is going at about five o'clock, PM to the tickets, tickets, tickets booth in Times Square. Yeah. I'm dead serious. Right. You get a half price show to a show you have no idea what you're going to see. So the potluck aspect the, is what I you love enjoy. the serendipity of it, and you can go for cheap, and that's what you can do when you live here. You can also do it when you're visiting. It's day of tickets for no, half I know. price. Yeah. yeah, I know you know. I'm explaining. Right. It's, yes, this is I the know. hottest <laughs> tip for New York, though: is go TKTS. see a show that you have no idea what you're going to see because mm. everything on Broadway is at a certain level of quality. You're going to see something that's at least yes. quite polished. You know. Are you a musical fan or a drama comedy fan? Where does your allegiance lie when on the Broadway spectrum? I like it all, but I feel like when you're here in New York and you have access to the best musicals in the world, it's hard not to go see a musical. I feel like it depends on who I'm with. If I'm going by myself, I'll tell you, this is going to date me, but the Eric Bogosians and, oh, the, sure. yeah. and the John Legozamos who did these mm -hmm. one-man shows, yes. even Whoopi Goldberg, who before anything anyone has ever seen her or in film. Bruce had, Springsteen was doing this again. On yeah, Broadway. we'll ask, uh, I think Frank will know about uh, Springsteen announced it and sold out very quickly. That, think, that encourages me. Uh, but is it all Springsteens? Is it all going to be like... Uh, uh, John Cougar Mellencamp for, for six weeks on Broadway. I mean, you know, part of this is mounting it all again. In, this, in the 1960s, do you know that they had not only an orchestra, but they had a band on the set, they had singing dancers, and then they had dancing dancers. <laughs> the companies were 500 people. I don't think anything close to that is going to happen in post-pandemic Broadway. And I wonder if, I mean, I don't think everybody, I don't think lovers are going to sing six feet apart from one another. No. Uh, but, you know, you're packed like sardines into those yeah. Broadway houses or they don't make any money. So, But you just can't do it, I think, if anyone's even has a whiff of COVID fear. Okay, so will you go back, uh, either one of you, David? I would love to be their opening night. What, but will will one of the stipulations be that everyone who's there is vaxxed and can prove it? I'm vaccinated. I'm vaccinated, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, do you think that uh, the Broadway theaters should make people prove that they've had a vaccination? I do believe in that, yes. And? Don't care. No, as long as you are, I'm they're, they're the ones They can do what risk. they want. Yeah. Free country, man. What do you think is the role of criticism today in a world that is changed because of COVID? Uh, well, I think equality is still quality. I think you can't go and say something that's bad is good just to fill audience, you know, just to fill houses. Uh, but that's a perfect question for Frank. I mean, he's he covers it. He's not a critic per se. He he covers the world of uh, theater. and But of course, he speaks to critics. And, and, uh, well, it might be really hard is for a critic to come back and be really tough on a show. When they really want yeah. Broadway to come back, they really want it to Great succeed. Point. And, they, and they're going to be like, this isn't very good, but I right. really want I everything to go. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of sure things. Like that's what they're going to come back with the sure things first. They'll come back with the big names. They'll come back with the big shows, the stuff they know tourists will see, the stuff they know New Yorkers want to see, the one of a kind experiences. I have never had an experience in a theater like that Springsteen show. I saw it live and it was just mind boggling. Is he coming back to do the exact same thing that he did before, as Absolutely. far as we know? Yeah. I mean, he did the Netflix version of it, so that's out there. So maybe oh, there'll be so some maybe small he'll change changes. It up a but like, I doubt yeah. it's much. It's it's a it's a written show. Yeah. Uh, as is this, never. Uh, we just <laughs> we just sit here and decide what to chat about. Uh, I, I'm curious to know from him also uh, what makes a good Broadway show. Like, what are the elements? If there's anything, is there some secret sauce or some kind of formula that that makes sure it's going to be what a big I've hit? Found really exciting the last 
really effective shows. There were three different shows. Uh, once, the Broadway version of uh, Once. Did you go on stage? I was not sitting on stage, but the, but the Broadway version, the new Broadway version of Oklahoma, they just did a revise like right before pandemic, and um, Hades Town. All three of those shows had the musicians on stage playing instruments, had right. members of the cast, all, the entire orchestra is on the stage, and the actors are playing the instruments. And, it's and at once, magical. you could go on stage before the before it opened and buy a beer, I think. Yes, they had seats you could, on stage. Yeah, and you could, I saw a version of Sweeney Todd set in a pie shop where they served <laughs> pies before the thing. And if you know the story of Sweeney Todd, you know what's in those pies. And you got out alive. Uh, so, that was, so you weren't right in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Right. Uh, David, what are we going to see? Uh, what what's going to be the biggest draw? Do you think in this uh, in this new Broadway? Is it you know? I think Scott's right. It's going to be a lot of sure things, and I'm just wondering what uh, they're going to start releasing those numbers. And I got to tell you both. I heard from I'm going to ask Frank about this. I heard from an inside source that all the ads we're seeing, Hugh Jackman's coming back as the Music Man, and all of those things are only going to happen if they get enough ticket sales. And then all of a sudden they're going to say, "Oh, uh, we can't do it." I look forward to the star wattage. I have had one of my worst experience be with a leading cast member replaced by someone from American Idol, <laughs> and it was so horrifying i apologize if you're listening i hope beyond anything else that writing is valued highest because the quality of writing that we see on broadway is so moving it's the the, the innate theatricality of it the stuff that really makes your spine tingle but i do think marquee events disney productions will most likely be we need to be the leaders. Moved. This is a time when we need to be moved. And when you talk about start putting the wrong people in a role, you're talking to a guy who paid a lot of money to go see Quentin Tarantino in Wait Until Dark, which was, I don't <laughs> need, sorry. If you remember that like 15 or 20 years ago. It was his, he, I guess it was on his bucket list and he was not very good. And I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. It's like Madonna in Speed the Plow. Did either of you see that? No, no. Well, you didn't miss anything. Uh, but, but well, these. But Speed the Plow is a drama. Yeah. Right. And Mammoth. and there's. I saw a Slave Play right before uh, this closed. I saw a couple years ago. I saw Doll's House Part Two. These these incredible original new dramas that are done, and those might be the challenge because those are not the shows that necessarily someone right. coming in from Iowa is like, hey, I want to see Wicked. Like, of course you do. You definitely do. Do you want to see a Doll's House Part Two? Like, that's, that's a different sell. I do think. Someone like Jeremy O. Harris, who wrote Slave Play, is the future. And the way he's mobilized his social media, he's bringing theater to a whole new type of audience. Digitally, it's Gen Z out there being like, this is what I need to catch. This is what I need to catch hold of. And I look forward to whatever he has and, coming out And yet out it's next. live. And, and the experience of being in that theater with those, with that material... It, it's like it's an experience to be there with the other people to s have everyone reacting to extremely provocative material um, and have I think I talked about that show longer afterwards than any other show I've ever well, seen. Well, one of the jobs of besides taking us out of the world is to also reflect what's happening and I think that uh, you know, bringing back To Kill a Mockingbird and some of the other things that have been socially resonant and... Uh, with Jeff Daniels. With Jeff Daniels is back, uh, but without Scott Rudin. We'll talk about that too. I, I, that's, uh, a, uh, for those of you who don't know, a producer who was accused of treating people badly and uh, is no longer... I was, I was fascinated at the concept that a play would come back and they made the announcement that the producer wouldn't be attached to it anymore because I would have thought all the hard work anyone who's a producer is listening is going to be very mad at me. All the hard work is done now we've cast everybody, it's all set, we're gonna uh, so the idea that he wasn't going to be attached to it anymore I think was kind of a publicity stunt I'm imagining uh, but we we are going to try and build again we are going to bring Broadway back and uh, we're going to talk to a man who goes to everything on a stage everything you could ever want to see uh, Mr. Uh, Frank DeLella joins us after the break. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com, and discover our Accutron DNA collection. Reimagined for a new generation, the Accutron DNA combines breakthrough technology, precise engineering, and modern aesthetics to achieve a new level of technical excellence. The Accutron DNA, the new face of time for those who blaze new trails. 
Frank, welcome to the Accutron Show. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, we'll change that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Good sir, to know. What What was the last thing you saw live on Broadway before the pandemic? The Girl from the North Country, the Bob Dylan musical, yeah. set in the Depression, the Great Depression. So... <laughs> Kind of the perfect setup for the next period, and I'm not, I, you know, I'm making a joke of that, but, um, you know, it's it's hard to believe that was when that was March, right? Do you remember that opening. date? Was it like so? The thirteenth yeah. is when everything shut down. That well, Friday the thirteenth, right? But or? March twelfth was uh, originally supposed to be the opening of six, the musical, and right. we were we were heading on over there to cover it. And I'll never forget being in the newsroom. I work at New York One. Um, Bill, which you know very well <laughs> as an alum of New York One, um, and you know, kind of hearing through the grapevine that things were going to get shut down. And as I was getting texts because there were these secret meetings going on, the big opening night that night was Six, which was a highly anticipated musical coming over from the UK, lots of buzz around it. And then, sure enough, that was the first show to get canceled. And um, in terms of that opening night not happening, and then it was a trickle down effect from there. <laughs> it's just amazing to me that we're all sitting here. We're going to talk about the future of Broadway, but that night and those days leading up to that, the big thing everybody must have asked you was, they're not going to close Broadway, are right, they? Right, right. Well, you know, at first we thought we were getting text messages two weeks, or I was getting text messages two weeks, or maybe four weeks, but not, you know, all this time, 15 plus months. Uh, one of my co-anchors at New York One, uh, you know, I did the nightly news that night. I did the 10 o'clock show. And a dear friend of mine, Cheryl Wills, who hosts the 10 o'clock news program, she said, she, she was like, Frankie, baby, this is going to be a long time before Broadway comes back. It's going to be a long time. And she was absolutely right. Well, I mean, of all businesses, it seems like you, it's one thing to have audiences. And so that's similar calculus to the movie theaters. In Broadway, you've got these performers on top of each other backstage, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you think about what goes into making a show, especially a musical, you know, you have people in the pits, you have people backstage, the stagehands, you have, you, you know, actors literally getting changed on top of each other. Not to mention the audience, you know, we know we've all been in a Broadway house. <laughs> those those seats are pretty tight. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, not very conducive for a global pandemic, I, I shall say. <laughs> How did your job change during the pandemic? And more importantly, what did you do to keep your community motivated? Well, you know what? As soon as we knew, Bra Dave, you actually just gave me chills saying that because it's so weird to think, you know, like this mode we went into. Uh, one of my bosses said to me, she was like, you know, you're all going home, but you're going to stay on the air and do whatever it takes to stay on the air. So we took that to heart, uh, me and my team. And, you know, I, I did, I remember going to the studio and basically saying, you know, this is the mandate from the governor. Broadway is shutting down for what we knew then a month, but we will do everything in our power to continue to tell the stories of the community. And we, if that means Zooming, and I never knew what Zoom was prior to the pandemic, uh, if it means, you know, staying in touch via social media, whatever it takes, we will do this. And we will be in this for the long road, uh, which, you know, now uh, takes us into 2021 and, and we're still here. And, and there is light at the end of the tunnel, thank God. Did you have a moment where you just stuffed as much camera equipment in your bag as you could? And <laughs> we're at the door. Yes. And, um, and, and, and like I said, learning Zoom, learning editing software, um, just figuring all that stuff out because this was a whole new world to us, you know? Um, yeah. I, early on, I remember, uh, I'll never forget getting like Andrew Lloyd Webber's assistant on the phone and saying like, okay, so we're going to do a Zoom interview. It, like, does Andrew know how to do this? And Andrew was more, you know, sad when it came to like the technical stuff than I was. My producer was like, wait, I, I want a different shot. And Andrew was like kind of instructing us what to do. It was pretty great. He always wants to direct. <laughs> <laughs> so who was lousy? Who got on Zoom and really didn't know what to do? Oh. Was Angela Lansbury on mute for like no, 20 minutes? I, God, I love I love Angela. Actually, uh, we, we did a big speaking of Zoom for her birthday um, this past year. Uh, or, or what is time? It was last October. Um, uh, <laughs> each, uh, her assistant to me and a bunch of well-known folks who you would know to do a little Zoom uh, birthday trip. So to no her. big, no big failure Zoom-wise over the. No, okay. no, no, no. Thank God. 
Thank God. You know, I I did adopt a dog during COVID, and I always thought, like, you know, during one of those moments of being in a big interview with someone over Zoom, you know, my doorbell would ring and he would go crazy. But we've actually been pretty good, even during the live stuff too. So that's that's so people listening to this around the country want to know about whether or not Broadway is going to reopen and whether you think that's going to be successful, and then whether those road companies are going to get to tour out you know, arrest around the rest of the country. So what, what the short answer is, are we really going to reopen in the fall? And then is it all going to trickle out to the rest of the world? The short answer is we're actually going to open next week, Bill, or this week, Saturday, the 26th, Bruce Springsteen's solo right. show is yeah. opening on Broadway. It's coming back. It's coming back at the St. James Sold Theater. Sold out in 30 minutes. Oh my God. For, gonna, for the whole month. Yeah, for like, yeah. yeah. And I think it actually just got extended. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's getting extended. So when this airs in July, that will have been a huge yeah. success for at least two or three weeks totally. by the time we're, people are hearing this. Totally. And um, the national tour of Wicked is going to open in Dallas, I believe in August, and they go into rehearsal um, sometime soon. Well, they didn't get COVID in Texas. <laughs> Didn't you get that memo? <laughs> okay, so but Broadway is uh, coming back. <laughs> will we all sit next to each other? Yeah. So yeah. we're and there's not going to be plexiglass between everyone, or as of right now, no. Or empty seats. I mean, you still go to the movie theater. And it's, and they it's have seat the, spacing. The only way the numbers can work on Broadway is if it is at 100 percent capacity. So that is going to be the thing. It's I'm going to Bruce's show on Saturday night, his first performance. So I will see uh, what protocol is you know we did a big special with tom schumacher who brought the disney broadway production of frozen down to sydney australia in december and for some uh or for many producers and theater owners that kind of acted as the blueprint of what it's going to look like and for the most part all those shows were sold out and it was a full capacity type situation is there a rule of thumb in terms of audience percentage like how full the theater is to like how long a show can run can they run at 80 can they run it again it's think of each show as its own little business right they all have different models like if you're doing a musical like six where you know it's basically um you know an all-female uh ensemble uh you know the, the who play the wives of henry the eighth the former wife or the wives of henry the eighth and you have a band on stage you know Depending what the numbers are, you, you know, you can make your money back faster as opposed to doing a big splashy musical a la Wicked where you have a huge ensemble, okay. big principal company so the numbers and numbers shift depending on the production. Absolutely. Do you think in this time the role of the critic has changed? That's an interesting question. You know, right before the pandemic, I would my answer to that would be that um, you know, everyone's now a critic, you know, due to social media, you know, especially Bill. Bill, Bill knows what, what well, that's like. But there isn't, no, there isn't really a Rotten Tomatoes for, for, for Broadway. Broadway. Uh, so, you're, you know, you, there's a functionality for, for the critic, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. And, and, and still, you ask a lot of producers, you know, the, the gold standard is getting that, you know, a star review in the New York Times, like that's what they want. That's what they still want. But I think what David's saying is, are, are, do they have a greater role to be a bigger cheerleader to get people back in seats and maybe look past something that's needs a little work? And let's just get folks back. Hey, let's we've got a barn. Let's put on a show. Well, absolutely. And I think you know any kind of feature reporter too. That's that's their role too to kind of like create the buzz, create the you know oomph that Broadway is going to come back and it's going to be bigger and better than ever. You know what I mean? I spoke to one producer, and I'm not trying to put you in the hot seat here, but uh, who said, don't believe everything you're hearing about Broadway coming back in the fall because if they don't do if they don't get the sales, they're not opening the shows. Well, the thing is, and I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but right when the when tickets started going on sale for you know some of the major shows, uh, it's my understanding that tickets aren't as solid as producers would like them to be. And I, I do think, you know, we have to take things into consideration. You know, a lot of these shows are fueled by tourists and international tourists. Right. And until, you know, borders open across the board, you know, there is going to be a decline in terms of people, you know, attending each show, a uh, show a night. And well, also the situation is changing week by week. 
It yeah. feels like, like, you know, this week versus next week, different animals. One month ago versus today, completely different That's animals. Right. So it's this really moving target. That That's right. That's right. Difficult. I mean, look what's happening over in London. You know, the government keeps changing things and these shows which are told, yes, you can open at full capacity or like, you know, getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. I mean, they've had to like open, close, open, close multiple times throughout this entire pandemic. And they're just at their wit's end. And also these producers are freaking out because every time they do that, money is lost. Don't they get a lot more government support? They do. They do. Um, it's cheaper to put up a brand new show over in the UK versus here. Just And, and a lot of that also has to do uh, with the unions too. The unions are stronger here than they are over in the UK. I wish I could act surprised. Are we going to see a lot of what uh, the Springsteen thing means? Like Jerry Seinfeld, like, like things that are easy to produce with one or two people? I want to say yes, and and there's been rumblings. I've actually uh, a couple of producer friends of mine have said that they want to bring some like you know a list talent to the stage uh, during this time, especially in the fall, and and kind of lead that into the spring and summer of next year. But also the majority of the stuff that was supposed to open or had just started previews back in the spring, it's all coming back. In fact. Recently, uh, I heard some of the shows which announced that they're going to come back in October or November maybe pushing up their dates earlier because there is such this push. To of, Kill a Mockingbird is coming to back. To Kill a Mockingbird yeah. is coming back. With Companies coming back. Uh, Six, as I mentioned, Moulin Rouge, uh, West Side Story, Book of Mormon. Do you think the formula for the fever will be the same, the sharp writing, the A-list talent, or will people be looking for something different? Or what do you, what do you think leads to the mega hit, the Hamilton of things. Again, there is no, I would like to say there is a formula. There is no formula for Broadway for what's a hit on Broadway. I'll never forget when Wicked first started previews. Uh, it, well, first off, when Wicked was playing out of town, it was a disaster basically. <laughs> and, you know, people were kind of like poo-pooing it before it even hit. New York. And then I remember like when it started previews, people were like, uh, oh, this show about the the witches of Oz, whatever. And then as soon as the that show opened and word of mouth, I mean, word of mouth to me is the strongest thing for Broadway. Like, I don't care what anyone says. If you like think about Hamilton Book of Mormon, I I mean, when Book of Mormon first came out, uh the the genius thing that the producers and 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 I'll I'll say that and take it for what it is. Uh, what they did, they did not tell anyone what it was about. And I'll never forget going to the press day for the Book of Mormon, and I'm interviewing all the actors, Nikki James, Josh Gad, Andrew Rannells, you know, these star names now, like really unknowns then. And I would say, so what is the show about? Well, we can't really tell you. And so like behind <laughs> closed doors, people started seeing the Book of Mormon and like this word and buzz spread like wildfire. Oh my gosh, just wait until you experience the show. It's totally <laughs> original. It's so cool. It's so fun, irreverent, and you're. it's by the guys who did South Park. Well, and, let's talk uh, about the irreverent part because one of the things that's, be, that's come out in the last couple of days is that when that does come back, it's going to be tamed, it's going to be tempted down a little, that there's a woke thing that's happening everywhere and that in Broadway that you couldn't do a spam a lot again. You couldn't do some of the jokes that were in Book of Mormon before. So how is that going to affect everything? Well, the, speaking about Book of Mormon uh, directly, I know they did a workshop. I know they did a workshop over Zoom, if I'm not mistaken, that um, where they tried things out and they're, they're figuring things out because there has been a lot of controversy or spotlight on that show and really asking questions, what is this, right? I think the amazing thing that happened during this time is that we're, we're, we got a reset. A social justice movement kind of erupted uh, across the country and around the world, but also specifically on Broadway. You know, for the past uh, couple of months, there have been these protests in terms of, you know, behavior of producers, you know, uh, calling out people like Scott Rudin saying, you know, you can't treat people like the way you've been treating them. We live in a different world now. And um and I also think material-wise, you know, I just interviewed the playwright of this uh, new play called Passover that, um, you know, uh, is it deals, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, from what I understand, deals with police brutality in some uh, type of way. And that's going to actually be the first play to open 
on Broadway. It, previews begin August 4th. So you have material that's going to start to pop up that's going to reflect what's happening in our society. And that's what it always do. did. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it always yeah. did. Like in the 60s, we had hair and we had some of the things. Since the Accutron show is about and celebrates uh, things from the 60s, a, a lot of things that... Uh, were huge hits then became revivals. We had Hello Dolly come back. We had, uh, we've had a lot of things. Uh, we we haven't had hair again. But West Side we have, Story? Yeah, West Side Stories. Yeah. Well, hair, not too long ago, hair, in 2009. Ago. Yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah. Did they, yeah. Uh, yeah? yeah. So, uh, what was your favorite as a kid growing up? Uh, what was, the, if you had to pick one of the musicals that may have been one of the first ones or a regular stage production, what was one of the first ones you saw or what was one of your favorites? Um, uh, Chorus Line. My mom took me to see the national tour of A Chorus Line in the early 90s, and to this day, that remains my favorite musical. Just that whole idea of, you know, the the, the backstage element of show business and, and what this really is, but also that um, uh, quote-unquote American Idol-style form and documentary-style form of storytelling. God, I hope I get it. Exactly. <laughs> I hope I well, get we're it. Gonna, which character do you really, relate to, Really, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be Michael Douglas. All right. <laughs> I actually want to talk about something a little personal. Mm -hmm. We were college roommates. That's right. And I R actually wow. saw you edit your first reel in the computer labs. I was there because I was studying film. And Dave, you, let, let's let's just be honest. You actually did it, and I thought you were going to kill me because I kept like giving you changes. I remember. To I remember. <laughs> Could Wait, you where'd you guys go? Ford, Ford, Lincoln Ford Center. At Lincoln Center, yeah. Could you have imagined then... That this many years later, you would have played yourself in the prom. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no, because you were there for my whole journey because I came to New York wanting to be an actor. That was something that, you know, I started studying at Fordham early on. And as we do in college, we were searching for ourselves and trying to find ourselves. And Again, we had a very talented class. Taylor Schilling was in our class and, you know, Kelly Curran, who's going to be on The Gilded Age, which is coming out, which is going to be a huge thing for her, was in our class and it was a small class. And I realized if I'm going to survive in this city, I need to come up with a plan B. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I got an internship at New York One and through that time, realized that, you know what, I can still kind of check off that, you know, that bug of, you know, kind of being involved with entertainment by covering entertainment. And, you know, we have this great show on Spectrum News New York One called On Stage, which I'm now the host of. And it literally is the Broadway community. Um, you know, everything about the Broadway community and off-Broadway community. And um, so it's, it's kind of figuring out what I wanted to do, and then everything kind of opened up from there, you know. Um, and then you interview some of those people on those stages, yeah. and then every now and then, don't you like get to do a little dancing or kick your kid? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and and is there what's is what's the push and pull in that? It's like, oh, if I had only, oh, I like what I'm doing. I well, mean, where? Well, I uh, honestly, the 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 point is, I feel like I've gotten more opportunities going down this path than I would have if I you know, continue to try to be an actor. I mean, from playing myself, uh, as you mentioned, in Ryan Murphy's <laughs> The Prom, Ops and Meryl Streep, to, you know, being on Smash. They cast me on Smash. I actually just did a little stint on Gossip Girl, which is coming out in July. Yeah, so. you're like Larry King. He played I mean, himself in all of those dopey movies, yeah. and now we see you in the... <laughs> I'm taking over, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, getting a gig opposite Meryl Streep is uh, not everyone gets to do that, and this was, was this was the amazing path to was, that. Yeah, That's did you have cool. your own dressing room? I did. So Meryl, uh, James, and I had our own trailers back to back, and um, we shot that in L.A. Ryan, uh, I had dinner with Ryan Murphy. Um, uh, a couple months prior and he had just bought the rights to the prom. He had just kind of like, you know, made it known that he was going to do the prom and we we're having dinner and he goes, oh, by the way, I'm putting you in the movie. And I laughed. I didn't believe him. And then sure enough. You guys were friends, friends. And he, yeah. So um, he would call you and say, what have you seen and what's good? Yeah, I'm coming he, to town. He, or I wanna... he, he loves the theater and we, you know, we'd go out to dinner. And also Ryan is a visionary. He's a genius when it comes to entertainment and um, also, you know, has a background in journalism. So I think, you know, just chatting with him and, and hearing my story, he was into it and also kind of, you know, getting the lay of the land. At the time, Boys in the Band was on Broadway and, you know, he was... I, we would go out and we'd just talk shop. And, you know, I love doing that with friends. And he, he he's told me then, we were at um, him dinner in the village and he said, I'm going to put you in the movie. 
I laugh. My manager gets a a note a couple months later saying we need Frank's availability for October, November, and December. Um, and it was a done deal. I'm in so. this whole movie. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you blink, and you, you blink, you miss me. But um, but it was clear that he wanted you to play yourself. Yeah. Yes. yeah okay. Yeah. So there wasn't yeah. that moment of oh, wait, am I? Yeah, who I never am auditioned I for right, it. Right. It was. It was so did you, Scott? Did you see the prom? Yes. Okay. And did you see it? Indeed, okay. I did. Okay. And let's in front of the man. Uh oh. What we think? Oh, I mean, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason for the season. Oh, right. As far as I can tell. Um, no, the, I mean, the, the prom was so much fun. It really was great. It was I, a load of fun. I love, yeah. I love the rise of Andrew Reynolds. Just yeah. makes, me, makes yeah. me really happy. Yeah. You know, like like he's he's all over the place. He just had a piece in the New York Times yeah. the other day. Yeah, theater's was, best. Seriously. And you? It came out at a time when that was exactly the film that I wanted to watch, what I needed yeah. on an emotional level, just to laugh and to laugh yeah. out loud. You need that candy sometimes. Yeah. Just like, it was yeah, the perfect medicine. It was. And I wasn't biased at all. On the street, on the, on Broadway, was that, w did they recreate that in California? Or so did, they was did. that shot on the, oh, that yeah. was, okay. So uh, it's my understanding that it would have cost way too much money to shut down, you know, the theaters for the amount of time that they needed. So Because um, they weren't shut down when it was made. No, no, okay. we, we filmed that. That was, I think, day two of shooting, and it was December of 2019. Um, they... He, they found this empty lot in downtown LA and they recreated Broadway. And wow. it was, I mean, and I'll never forget getting to set. Because I bought it in the movie. Yeah, I did yeah, too. I, was, yeah, I, I really yeah. thought they I live here. You know? so, so, <laughs> Ryan, so Ryan said, you know, his design team, they went to like 44. If you look at it, it's actually 44th and 45th Street combined because they added more theaters. But he said, like his design team would like measure the curb and the <laughs> curb would match, you know, every single thing. Like, you know, the tiniest detail, I, you, you could see Sardis from like where I was standing mm -hmm. and I could even see like they had this glass jar full of the Sardis matches, like everything to the tiniest <laughs> wow. detail was perfection. That must have been eerie. Yeah, exactly. It was like, <laughs> wait, where am I? Yeah. Frank DeLella may be more excited about Broadway coming back than any of us, but when we return, we're going to ask him what could fail on Broadway when we come back to the Accutron show right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our legacy collection. Reviving some of the most memorable Accutron watches from the 60s and 70s, the legacy collection combines timeless design with the technical excellence of Swiss watchmaking, each limited to 600 individually numbered pieces. The Accutron Legacy Collection, inspired by the past, built for the future. Welcome back. We're with Frank DeLella. He's an Emmy Award-winning host of On Stage on the Spectrum News New York One channel here in New York. Uh, and he has the enviable task of going to see everything on Broadway, uh, sometimes twice. Uh, before we took the break, I said uh, we would ask you what might not work uh, when it comes back this fall. And I know you're a tireless cheerleader for Broadway, but is there something that a kind of formula or something that might not work? Uh, it's, it's, you know, Bill, I get asked this question all the time too. The, the, the question for me and only time will tell will be these bigger shows, you know, the, the long running shows. And I don't want to single anything out, but I will, you know, I'm curious to see what's going to happen with, you know, the Phantoms um, and, you know, the, the, the more long running shows, uh, you know, shows that rely heavily on tourists international tourists and if things are so closed in the fall um now phantom for instance is going to i believe they start they reopen on october 22nd so they're not part of that first wave does of the Spanish. chandelier still come down it still comes down right. and you know andrew lloyd weber has been an incredible champion on both sides of the pond for getting things back up and running um is this finally the window for love never dies <laughs> very good did you, did you ever see do you see it on broadway hd I've seen clips of it. We, okay. we didn't make it all the way through. All right, well, I, explain to the rest of us what that Love means. Love Never Dies is the sequel to The Phantom of the Opera, oh, which ah. was, uh, you know, when it played in the West End, it was sh short-lived. Um, but then they they revamped it down in Australia, and then it si has since toured uh, the U.S. And there is always talk about bringing it to Broadway. But it was sort of this notorious yeah. flop, right? Yeah. It didn't work. It didn't when work. They, it had one originally. of the most successful shows of all time, yeah. followed by one of the least successful yeah. shows of all time, which is kind of went to the formula yeah. thing of, right. you know, yeah. what, what... It was Godfather 3, the musical. 
Right. Basically. In in movie terms, yes. Has there what what was one show you went to and you just went, Oh no. Oh you guys. Was there anything that was particularly a standout that way? Of, of the answer is of course. Right. Um <laughs> whether or not I'm gonna tell you Oh to, if they closed, come on. Um, is it something that was just like just the, the bad concept? Okay. Just like, oh my god, how did they think that was gonna work? Um I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is a show called Quorum Boy, which I, I just like. Quorum Boy? I couldn't even tell you what it was. I was falling asleep in it. But um, <laughs> uh, I remember it was a really hot day when I saw it, and uh, it did not last very long on Broadway, and I was like, just get me the hell out of here. Right, 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 <laughs> so right. there you go. That's the answer. <laughs> I think it's important for me to say, because we keep working toward this direction and then receding from it, that in order for Broadway to succeed right now, New Yorkers really need to show up. Yeah, This mm. is something that is part of our heritage. I missed it. I've been craving it. I intend to support, but without our tourists, we need to be there to make yeah. these shows work, right? Yeah, you know, we've been, I've been out filming, shooting in Times Square since the early months of the pandemic. And Times Square, there's a lot going on there. It's not- How's Elmo? I, Elmo was fine, um, <laughs> you know, but, but in all seriousness, I, I don't feel hundred percent safe when I'm out in Times Square. You know, there, there've been some incidents recently, um, you know, where, where people have gotten hurt. Uh, there was a shooting there not too long ago. So, um, uh, you know, I just actually sat down with all the New York City mayoral candidates uh, for who were running on the Democrat ticket, and they're all saying that, you know, safety and cleaning up, you know, New York City, specifically Times Square, with getting the performing arts back is a priority. So I have a question sort of on the flip side of that. There's a certain chemistry to New York that has allowed Broadway to exist and to become this globally recognized word. Mm -hmm. You've covered theater internationally. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere else that you see a theater community emerging that we should be pointing our trend-setting eyes toward? Well, a lot of people say, you know, during the pandemic, uh, artists left New York City, right? And they've gone back home. And, you know, regionally, you know, over the years, for, for decades, we've gotten some amazing work from, you know, the regional theaters across the country. So I'll be interested to see what kind of comes from them, specifically uh, places, you know, like Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston, um, areas where, you know, it's, you know, it's a little easier to, to live in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day and, and, and the, the financing in, in that world. But, um, you know, like you said, Dave, Broadway is an international title yes. and word. And I really do think that um, there is nothing like Broadway and we just, we just have to support it. As New Yorkers, we have to support it first and then hopefully the tourists will return. Is it cheaper to put a show up in Chicago? Isn't equity equity and aren't the, the rates pretty much the same? I mean, the real estate's probably cheaper to rent a, a, a house there. But... Anywhere is cheaper than New York City. But <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been skirting also between the, mo the movie world and uh, the play world and uh, the stage world. And uh, did you think In the Heights was a better play than it was a movie? So I saw In the Heights first off Broadway. And I'll be honest with you, talking about things that I did not like. I remember seeing it off Broadway at 37 Arts. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what is this? It was a, it needed work, right? And I kind of went in kicking and screaming when it opened on Broadway. I was invited, I think, to the, the preview right before opening night. And I turned to my friend and uh, at intermission, I was like, oh my gosh, this show is amazing. So I was a huge In the Heights fan, you know, after seeing it on Broadway from then on. I really enjoyed the movie. Um, I, I'm curious to know as was a, the play two hours and twenty minutes? Yeah, it was. Yeah, so it was yeah. faithful and, in that and, way. And, <laughs> yes, and and um, I have to say, you know, it's it's different. the The film is different than the stage show. Did you see the yeah. stage show? Yeah. Um, you know, characters were cut, songs were cut. Um, yeah, but but it's a long film. It is a long. I mean, film. yeah, but most probably shows are three hours, probably right. They well, can be. We're, we're like with the intermission. I mean. 2.30, but of late, the, the the sweet spot is like a 90 minutes in and out. And when- <laughs> No intermission. <laughs> no intermission. Yeah, right. And honestly, whatever, you know, I, I mean- Well, well it, for someone who goes every night well, of the week. I mean, uh, well, yeah. here's the thing. I, I will, I'll admit to this. You know, I was taking 
you know, this whole thing for granted prior to the pandemic. But I would give anything to sit through like a three and a half hour show right now. Right. You know, sign me up. Yes. I'll go every night. I am intending to go, by the way, to every single opening on Broadway and every single show and be there cheerleading, screaming from the rafters, like get thee to a Broadway theater ASAP to see a show. Well, I think if you have extra tickets, we will come with you. I will have extra we tickets. So we'll, we'll do a theater right outing. Let's do it. You. <laughs> and, and also that goes for off-Broadway, Lincoln Center, you know, New York City Ballet, ABT, all that good stuff. Before we let you go, one last thing or a couple last things about this idea of what a success is versus a failure. Are, you know, William Goldman said a movie has three great moments. And so are, is there some kind of a metric for what makes a, a successful Broadway show? It has to have a great first uh, you, act you, break, well, right? Well, well, I always say, again, there is no formula, right? There is no formula. But for a musical, you can have the best music in the world. But if it does not have a solid book, it is nothing. A story, a good yes, story yes. for people. Um, the text. Uh, case in point, Gypsy. Gypsy is, to me, that, you know, many musical theater uh, fans and, and historians would say Gypsy is the perfect musical. Because you take Julie Stein's and Stephen Sondheim's music matched up with that libretto, that Arthur Lawrence libretto, and it's, it's perfect. That story is perfect. The whole arc is there. You get to know these characters. Um, and that score is just fantastic. So that, that to me is how we measure a musical. Play. And are you humming this? Uh, oh, are you absolutely. humming anything as There's you go out no of the theater? There's no business <laughs> like show. Come on, um, I'll, I'll sing the whole score if you want. Or we do. Oh, I wish we had the It'll time. Be great. <laughs> <laughs> but and and for a play for me, it's like you know, did it make me think? And did like w was I in the moment and just you know kind of living in this world that was created for me for the ninety minutes to two hours I was sitting in that theater? And if I walk away and I can't stop thinking about something and. It, the first thing that comes to mind is like Angels in America or seeing a solid production of Stricker named Desire. Like that to me, like there is nothing uh, like that in the theater. Uh, I have one button. more that is sort of, first of all, I do want to say I thought um, the bombast of In the Heights was quite remarkable and I enjoyed that experience wholly. But how do you feel about the reverse when the Disneyfication of Broadway or the the big blockbuster Warner Brothers musicals like the Harry Potter spectacle do you feel that serves a purpose on Broadway I'm going to say yes you know and I'm going to we're going to pinpoint Disney for a second you look at someone like Tom Schumacher who runs Disney on Broadway take a look at his resume where he came from I mean he literally came up through kind of like putting on you know, uh, very artsy stuff. He was in the animated world over at Disney, but then came over and like, you know, it, it's not just him transforming the Lion King with Julie Taymor, you know, this, talk about a visionary. She's a visionary, right? She like pre-Lion King was known as like the puppet lady and like the avant-garde artist who studied down at La Mama downtown. Like she, he, he, he did that marriage with Lion King. Peter and the Star Catcher with the brilliant Roger Reese and Alex Timbers. Again, Alex Timbers being a very downtown artist who then came up and now is mainstream and now is having much success with Moulin Rouge. So, yes, it does serve a purpose because you're introducing an entire generation and families to the art form of theater. And with that, that is their entryway into discovering this incredible world that is so rich with so many different things and... I mean, you, you can't go against that. You can't go it's, against and that. It's easy to hate on Disney, except when you get down to it, the movies they make for kids are amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and they've done this incredible stewardship of those, of those uh, IP. Yeah. As long as kids understand at the intermission, there's another half to the show. And they <laughs> exactly. Lily, they haven't forgotten the rest of the exactly. songs. I have hey, one I more wanna, question. Well, I want to ask David a question. How was his reel? <laughs> it's pretty charming. He's always been very charming. So he was a good actor. He's always been talented. <laughs> I think I think the story you did actually was one of the revivals of Glen, Glen Gary, Glenn Ross. It Indeed. was my interview with Liev Schreiber and um who else was in Was it Alan Arkin? Yeah. It was and Jeffrey Tambor. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. 
Uh, I have one last question, which is, uh, do you have any major guilty pleasures when it comes to theater? It's, it's easy to like go for quality and everything else, but like, is there anything you're just like, I just say, so I, well, Cats was one of the first musicals I ever saw. And I don't, I actually don't think Cats is the best musical. However, <laughs> I love cats. Uh, okay, so, so, so you're, first off, you're setting me up, and then you're giving my answer. Oh, cats, was, cats was the first show that I saw. I have to leave tour. this podcast right now. <laughs> I love we, cats so much. Thank we, you all we, for joining <laughs> us. Okay. Not the film. I was not oh, yeah. a fan of the film. The film is very strange. But <laughs> when, <laughs> very funny. <laughs> It was weird. Not for the right reasons. Um, but not intentionally. For yes. Me. But uh, when I was very young, my mom took me to see a national tour of cats before I came to New York. And um, it was in Philadelphia. And I remember saying to her afterwards, I don't want to leave the theater. Like, I, like something is here. Like, screw going to the playground. I want to stay in this space. Like, where these people wow. just, like, became these cats. And I'm in a junkyard. And I remember my mom saying, no, Frank, we're leaving. We'll get you the record. We'll get you the poster. But we're leaving. <laughs> And um, yeah, so so it would be cats, right? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, there there isn't. I, yeah, it was. I got to say, magical. the greatest na- night of theater for me. I got to say, the greatest night for theater of me was uh, probably Elaine Stritch the at the Liberty. I think at it was Liberty, called yeah. at Liberty. That was amazing. Best thing you saw, Boys in the Band. Recently, that's it. That's the first thing that came to my mind. What was that 2019? And Frank, before we let you go, of everything that is coming back, what's the one thing you're absolutely looking forward to? Probably company with Patti LuPone. Oh, wow. <sighs> yeah. yeah. She's just unstoppable. Yeah. She's, she's getting her uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Wow. It was just announced. She's a fire. She's yeah. a handful. Yeah, she she's... is. One of my favorite interviews. <sighs> I've interviewed her multiple times. And she... Talk about being blunt and candid. Yeah. You know, there is no deep stopping Patti LuPone. <laughs> <laughs> and no stopping you. Thank you. You are easily our favorite guest this season. Of course, this is uh, our first show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> thank, thank, you thank you for being a, a part of the Accutron show. And uh, we appreciate your insights. And we look like uh, we're going to be in the front row, too, for uh, some of those shows. And we're just as excited as you are that Broadway Theater is back. Thank you so I don't know much. if I want to sit that close to those people from out of town, but if I have to to support it, I will. Thank you for listening to The Accutron Show. To listen to all of our shows, visit AccutronWatch.com. To learn more about the world of Accutron, follow us on Instagram at Accutron Watch and subscribe to our podcast. From New York City, until next time, Accutron Time.